Good morning, Oceana. How is everyone doing? At ease? Everyone, please take your seats. It's great to see a full house. How do I do this? Both? Just a second. I think it's only appropriate on this Independence Day week. We are honored, and it's my pleasure to introduce Admiral Jonathan Greener, our 30th Chief of Naval Operations. A native of Butler, Pennsylvania, Admiral Greener has served at every level of command, to include command of USS Honolulu, 7th Fleet, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, and now as Chief of Naval Operations. Following command of USS Honolulu, Admiral Greenert was presented the Admiral Stockdale Award for Visionary Leadership. Our Navy could not be in better hands. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Admiral Greenert. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here, and for those that were streaming this, so we'll get maybe some questions or remarks. Danny, I can stand anywhere up here, is that right? Yeah, because we, we got video over. Okay, so uh, out there, we'll get some uh, questions maybe from out in the uh, in, uh, internet right there. But it was interesting. This is about my maybe fourth time here. I understand between vice chief, lead forces, and this job. Uh, and it's struck me the last time we got off the plane, we couldn't hear anything. In other words, we could hear ourselves talk because we weren't flying. And I drove around. The grass was high. Looked like kind of hay field. And that was in the middle of sequestration. I got off here, and it's freaking loud as can be. There are jets going. And I said, all right, this is the way it's supposed to be at Oceana. And uh, well, the grass is cut, so that's nice, whatever. But uh, you got a lot of rain, too, so that must be uh, one heck of a thing. So it's a little warm in here, so uh, try to relax as best you can. I'll try to keep a low stress here. And I want to talk about what you want to talk about. But let me give you just a few clips here on uh, what kind of what's going on. Uh, being in naval aviation, in my opinion, around this time is pretty cool, especially if you are a mid-grade petty officer or a mid-grade officer. I mean, your lives are different from mine, but here's what, what I see right now out there uh, in the future. Uh, we have got uh, this base will be a master jet base. The Joint Strike Fighter is coming, and it will be, uh, our version will be around in about three years. And, in some parlance, that's right around the corner, especially if you're the CEO of the base and you're trying to get ready for that. Or you're at Oceana, uh, excuse me, you're at uh, uh, Lemoore trying to get ready out there. The E2G, the Hawkeye, it is unbelievable what it can do out there with the Navy integrated fire control, especially the counter air mode. There is more to be done in that regard, but that ability to network what that airplane sees and put it out in all of our strike fighters and our electronic attack and on our ships and ashore and with other members and joint players is astounding. The Theodore Roosevelt demonstrated it, has taken it on deployment, and it is opening our eyes in the joint force for what we can do out in the maritime field. To have some for to have this person to detect it, everybody see it and tell somebody else to launch on it is a game changer. The growler, we thought, okay, we're gonna buy this many growlers, and we said, now we're gonna buy more, and I'm still not sure if we're done buying growlers. They are awesome, that we need electronic attack. We cannot just bust our way in. We will need to suppress, and it will be a key and critical part of not just the air wing, but of the entire joint force. We are the jamming entity, if you will, to get in uh, to, to get access, joint access, uh, in the joint force. And that growler is the key piece of that. Of course, the joint strike fighter is coming. Uh, we have to work our way to the air wing of 2024 with getting the legacy Hornets that we need to that period of time. We gotta take care of the super Hornets. Uh, there's some more kind of working their way through the budget. and We will have to work our way through to have the right mix of joint strike fighters and super Hornets as we get out there. So uh, that's the air wing as it's evolving out there into the future. There's an unmanned part of this that is going to take place. We have the Triton, which is basically, it looks like a large global hawk, well, a global hawk, but it's marinized. It's tricked out to be able to see things uh, on the water. And that will, again, broaden the eyes of the fleet, uh, both ashore and on land. And that will be huge gobs of data now coming in. And we have to figure out how to manage that. And we're working on that right now. Because we will know so much more that uh, we've got to keep ourselves from being overwhelmed between just data. And we've got to get that to correct information. 
and intelligence. We'll have unmanned carrier, uh, uh, carrier launched uh, attack and surveillance, U class that will come in the 2020s. So lots of stuff coming into uh, meta, a metamorphosis of the fleet, and we're building two new carriers. Uh, we're building the Ford, and we're building the JFK, and the Enterprise is right behind that. So as we turn the corner into the 2020s, the Air Wing is going to be a pretty modern, uh, pretty effective entity. Uh, and this is a master jet base for that here at Oceana. So very, very bright future. So that all feeds into your Navy out and about. So I only have one slide, but I need to give you a little pictorial, if I could put that up, about where we are. That's good to know. So uh, and that's not what I want. I just want the, the Navy today, please. OK. Just go, yeah, here we go. So today we have about that many ships, 273, and a third of them are out and about. In your Navy today, you can anticipate the number of ships we have, about a third of them will be deployed. Now, by 2020, you look at that number, 2020, five years, we're going to have 300 ships. And you say, well, wait a minute, CO. CNO, what about all the budget things? Now, I'm talking about ships that are already under construction. They won't be influenced by budgetary changes this year, last year, or next year. We, next year, we'll have four little combat ships join the ship during the fleet alone. And we'll be between three or four every year joining the fleet. Two years ago, we had 17 frigates. At the end of this fiscal year, we'll have zero. We are retiring the Perry class frigates that class and the little combat ships a little slower getting integrated into the fleet and therefore the rapid change down and the rapid change back up. Uh, out and around the world as you see today about a third, 45,000 and it's really about being where it matters when it matters. Now um, let me give you an example of that. You can take that down Danny. Just a few weeks, uh, months ago uh, the Iranians were, had sent a convoy with lethal aid and they were going to head from Iran down to, uh, really, uh, the Bab el Mandeb Straits, right down by Aden. And they, were, they wanted to resupply the, the Houthis. Well, there was a United Nations Security Council resolution that says you can't do this, a terrorist group. And uh, really, the coalition of the willing, which centerpiece was us, uh, we were, as we saw this convoy going down, actually, Danny, put that back up so I can give people a perspective. Please, thank you. So it started here, and they were going to go down there. So they got about here. We had the TR out here. We brought her down there. There was a Spanish ship, a UK ship, uh, a UAE, United Emirates. The, the Saudis were flying over there. And because we were able to bring that kind of force together, do uh, a show of, of power, if you will, of intent, the Iranians decided this isn't a good idea. This isn't going to work out very well. And they decided to turn around. I can't tell you precisely why they turned around, uh, but you can probably imagine if you've got an air wing flying all over the place with uh, strike fighters and everything else, P-8s flying around you and a coalition, probably say this probably isn't a good idea. So we were able to react to that in a matter of days. If we weren't out there where it matters, able to react when it mattered, uh, this could have been a very different outcome. They could have delivered that, which included cruise missiles, mines, and small patrol boats, and some of those, some call them suicide boats, down there in the Bab el Mendeb Straits uh, here, which is a serious crossroad, a lot of trade there, and we'd have had a problem. We'd had that thing maybe constrained for a while. Almost a year ago, 10 months ago, uh, the president said, uh, we're going to take action against ISIS. So I need, I need the ability to do strikes in this area right in here. I need to do it in Syria, and I need to do it um, in Iraq. Uh, so what you guys got, DOD? Well, what we had was the Bush. It was up here doing operations in Afghanistan. And in basically a day and a half, repositioned from there to the north, from the North Arabian Sea to the North Arabian Gulf. Day and a half, boom. She's ready to do 30 to 40 sorties, whatever they needed. They needed about 30. And she was the only option the, the air wing from the Bush and some Marine Air was the only option we had in the coalition, the whole coalition, because we couldn't get access yet for about two months. So that's being where it matters when it matters. That's an example of it, of what you all are doing out there. I know some of you served maybe in some of those operations, at least one of them, that I talked about. But uh, our time at sea and our deployments 
Right now, they're too long, and I call it unsustainable. The, the TR is out there now. I expect she'll be out there about eight months and so many days. The bush did 10 months, and uh, the, we, that's just too long. We can't sustain that. Uh, my goal, and we are on track right now for the Truman's deployment to be a seven-month deployment. The last two amphibious ready groups, including the Iwo Jima, who's on her way home, seven-month deployments. That, to me, is uh, sustainable for not only what we're asking you to do and your families, but the ships, the aircraft, and, and to get the maintenance done. So our way to do this right is the fleet response training plan, the response plan and the response training plan. You get the maintenance done in time with enough shipyard workers and enough time to get the maintenance done, to get your jets done so you can turn them around and your, and your aircraft, to get people in place to be able to do the training and to be able to then go do the training and have the time at sea to get the training and get it done, not linger out at sea, to get better organized in our training. All of those lines of effort have to come together and come together right. Lastly, uh, you're probably aware the Secretary of the Navy has, uh, working with Chief of Naval Personnel and myself, we've put together some initiatives to look into the future and have a better force. We call it uh, Future Force uh, Sailor of 2025. And, and what, we're, what we're looking at is a better way to organize, train, and equip Manning, to provide uh, more empowerment to our commanding officers for things like, really, the, the PFA. Uh, and we'll, we'll make that change here in the not too distant future. Uh, for advancements, to be able to have career intermission, to take sabbaticals for those of you that have families, to do better at co-location, have the fitness centers open longer. So we're looking at things like that. Uh, if you haven't read the Secretary's speech or the NAV admin that he's put out recently which describes these, I urge you to do it. It won't happen every, uh, overnight because many of what we, many things that we want to do, we have to go to the Congress and get permission. But I got to tell you, folks, I've seen some of this before. These, uh, we want to make some changes, personnel changes, and they're very, very tightly managed. But we are very well lined up with your Secretary of Defense. He wants to do this, and we've got some uh, pretty good support uh, up on the Hill. So stay tuned for that. So let me open the floor up for things that you all want to talk about. Uh, I've got some lights up here, so I'm, in my eyes, I can see you uh, generally, uh, but not fully. So we'll work through this to find out who's up and, uh, and what the question is, both uh, here in the, in the auditorium and out there in uh, internet land. So floor is open for questions. Yes, sir, I can barely see a hand. Well, probably best if uh, you, oh, go ahead. If you have a question, get up and head to the aisle, and then we'll go back and forth. Good morning, sir. Good morning. AT3 Alexander from FRC Oceana. Um, I just had one, one question that I really wanted to ask. Uh, I'm, I'm finishing out my degree. And I'm a little bit older, I joined later than most people do, and a lot of the problems that I'm, I'm running into trying to become an officer is the age limit. Have you heard anything, or do you know anything as far as them moving the age limit and, and allowing somebody to become an officer, uh, even though they joined a little bit later? Uh, there's nothing on the books right now that is imminent. In other words, uh, that we're looking at immediately. On the other hand, we are looking at age, and the fact of the matter is, people live longer, people join later. Um, we, we, are, we can talk about the retirement system if you want, and the, re, the changing retirement system, not yours, it'll be somebody else's, uh, and the options that it brings would, would lead us to having, allowing people to come in older, if you will, a little older. Uh, more mature, right? You're mature, right? Yes. Yeah, I can't even see it, but I'm sure you're not. <laughs> okay, uh, so I think that's coming. And I think it's around, just around the corner, frankly. Uh, miss, I think somebody over here. No? OK. Who's next? Go ahead. My dear, sir. Oh, please go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat your question. Go ahead. My name is M.A. Three Smith from the Naval Station Oceana Security Department. My question is, is there a timeline when the Navy will start implementing the 12-week convalescent leave for expected mothers? I know TRICARE has recently uh, started allowing us to have 
breast pumps, but is there any change to the complex fleet? Yeah, the question is, is there a time frame that we want to implement the 12 week uh, maternity leave, is that what you call it? convalescence leave? Uh, there's not a time frame, but we've requested it. You saw the secretary wants to do this, so now we say, do we have the authority in the Department of Defense to do that, or do we have to bring this up to the Congress? If, it's, if the authority is in the Department of Defense, we'll write it out and send it down and say, we want to do this. It's within the, if it's within SecNav's purview, let's go. If it's within SecDef's purview, we have to say, what do you other services want to do? Because we'll want to make it consistent. If you need to go to the hill, we'll run it over the hill. But he wants to do this as fast as feasible. We just need to figure out who, who's demanding you know, to, to approve it or give it the nod. OK? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, why don't you take the training supports and have the room? Um, throughout the last couple of years, there's been a lot of change with uh, advancing the advancing of the NA points, their conduct's going away, stuff like that. And then you also have a lot of changes going on with the PFA. Do you have considered people who score outstandings and stuff like that in the PFA implementing that into their advancing stands? Do you find multiple? Like a point system, so no good context, though, but people that are scoring outstandings get points towards the next, next advancing stand? Yeah, that is under uh, consideration, um, or at least uh, how, do we, how do we make sure that it's as pro properly documented, if not there in a points, uh, maybe in an evaluation, so that there's a, and then there's a, uh, uh, an award that, wanted to, that, that one would get, you, you all probably, it's probably Navy Times or some. That's all part and parcel. So I think that'll carry in. So that if, if you have, one has, happens to be an outstanding person in that regard, that it is part of their record and, uh, well, that's the kind of person we're looking for in the future, a healthy and fit sailor. Thanks, yeah. Okay, whoever's up. Good morning, sir. Good morning. RP3, Stephen Caldwell, from Training Sports Center, Hampton Roads. As of late, there have been some new developments with the legislation on gay marriage. What, moving forward, what is the Navy's upcoming policy to deal with both BH and a potential assault cases that may arise from that? Uh, you got me on that. Assault cases that arise from, from uh, areas being legalized in all states? Um, I can't make the connection. Maybe, can you give me a, are you there? <laughs> yeah, you ran away after that question. <laughs> so, uh, are you, uh, is that two questions or? See, let me let, go back to the mic and I'll talk while, while you're there. So um, our, and it's a DOD policy and our DOD policy is, you know, we acknowledge uh, that if the state uh, says it is legal to, ha you know, to have uh, uh, same uh, sex marriages there or whatever, uh, then we say, okay, you know, that's what the state says. So I, I'm not sure, I, I don't understand the question. We just kind of follow the law. That's what we really implemented after repeal of don't ask, don't tell. Go ahead. To clarify, because there has been a major split in most of uh, most of our communities between heterosexual and homosexuals, there's also a lot of tension between them, as some people are a bit more religious than them. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, how are we going to be able to protect our sailors that are recognizing with the LGBT community yeah. from those assaults? Well, let me tell you, um, I don't, I can't predict the future, but let me tell you what I've seen in the past. We spent a lot of time, I haven't been this, still in this job when we've repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I came out and the Mick Pond came out and we talked to a whole host of you. And uh, you, the, the Navy, the sailors in the Navy uh, approached us very professionally and said, these are my shipmates. And actually, I don't, I don't care very much about their proclivity one way or the other, whether they're gay or lesbian. They need to serve. They are sailors that happen to be gay. That's probably as, as simple as I can put it. Is that okay? And I haven't, I'm unfamiliar with, we've had one item about that since. Now, uh, there are already some states that do marriage, as you, as you know. And if, if the result of this ruling is now all states will do it, I, uh, I frankly don't lose any sleep at night. I figure all sailors work professionally. We treat everybody with dignity and respect. That's the foundation. Okay, and we won't tolerate anything but that. And I know you won't. <clears throat> All right, is there somebody here? <laughs> Hello, miss. Hello. I just want to leave one from Sydney at Hampton Road. I'm an instructor over there at Prince Hall Specialist School. I have a question, I guess, we'll kind of piggyback what, um, 
off of what RP3 said. Okay. Currently, we have command cookies for people who are MAs or for career counselors. You have command what? We have the cookies or the command emblems. The command emblems. All right. They are um, command career counselors or master at arms. Okay. So suggestion that maybe may help with RP3s. Um, unfortunate event in case someone is sexually assaulted to possibly have sapper advocates or even DAPAs with those command cookies so that sailors can actually seek them out and be able to locate people who are sapper advocates right off the bat in case they're not. That's not a bad idea. Advocates. Let me take that back. Give her a hand. That's a good idea. I need to take that back, okay? Yes, sir. One more, sir. My three colonel trench was in there have to roll. The question is, with trained members that are joining the Navy, how would that handle, how would that be handled medically? Transgender? Yes, transgender members are joining. How will we handle them medically? Yes. You know what? Um, we are in the process of uh, looking at, okay, what is uh, current DOD policy on transgender? Uh, what are we going to do? Do we want to change it? Uh, right now it is you can't uh, assess transgender in the Navy. It's not there. And so we say, okay, what, where do we go from here? And, and in view of where we stood with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Gay and Lesbian, how are we going to manage that? So I don't have an answer for you looking into the future, but this much I can tell you, uh, in about six months or so, you, you know, I think you're going to find, because we've got to look hard at this. How do we manage this? Privacy, uniforms, I mean, it sort of goes on. There's different uh, levels of transgender. When you start getting to hormonal uh, treatments and, and operations, you know, you're into a different world or different area of that. Uh, and so we need to look at that you know, from beginning to end, if you will, or from left to right, however you want to view it. OK? <coughs> Over here. Good morning, Admiral Captain, FRC. Uh, AOC Benoit from uh, FRC Oceana. Um, you touched a little bit about the uh, manning and um, ships, and mostly the air one, airway. Um, the ships have had an issue going back and forth to the yards, which has created, a, as you said, the 10 monthers, the 11 monthers. Right. Where do we fall in trying to keep our carriers in line in the PMS cycle into the yards? You know, you, you, you describe, um, briefly described the sustainability of the Newport News shipyard. Yeah. If they don't have enough people, then we don't have enough people. Um, you come back from a 10 monther, we're doing our sailors wrong and an injustice by them going into the yard period and stay until 18, 19, 20, 100, depending on the day and what's going on. Right. Well, we're downsizing it. And right. all these programs are not talking to each other. Right. You know, PRT failures, the legals, you know, numbers that sometimes change from one year to another. Right. How do we sustain that? Okay. So the question is, uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks, Admiral, for that discussion of uh, FRTP and how you can optimize it, but uh, we've got issues here. Our carriers are not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress this up a little bit. Our carriers are not getting any younger. Uh, their maintenance uh, scheme has uh, been shortened in some cases because of sequestration and our need to get out. So how do we make sure that we get out of the shipyard on time, that we get a proper availability, not on the backs of the crew? that about right? Yes, sir. Okay. Number one, you got to man up the shipyards right, and we are short uh, probably, or were, a couple of years ago, uh, on the order of 5,000 shipyard workers distributed around our public shipyards. Uh, and that includes Norfolk, and that also looking at Newport News, which is a private shipyard, but what we help augment each other. Uh, so we have been hiring feverishly to do that. We have the money in place to do that. That's going reasonably well. But it's not going to happen overnight. I can't hire you and say, congratulations, you're a welder, and then here, here's your flame, you know, here's your flame thrower, if you will, and your welding rods, and you get down there. So we are, we are hiring, we're, we are asking the, the uh, private shipyards to help us out with some work, and they are doing that. So for example, we will lighten Norfolk and send an SSN up to a private yard so more workers can focus on the carrier. So we've got to give the carrier time the part of the optimized FRTP is to expand the maintenance period, especially on the carriers, a couple months. To give you time in the yard to get done, we've got to man the shipyards right. Uh, the type commanders uh, have to work with fleet forces to be sure we're very clear on what we expect the crew to do while in there. 
and not. So it starts there. And frankly, these longer deployments, the reason we have the longer deployments, some people think, well, it's because of the, you know, the, we need them over there longer. No, it's because of sequestration a few years ago when we stopped maintenance. When we stopped maintenance, the world didn't stop. And so somebody was out on watch. And so they stayed longer. And then by the time we got somebody done to send them out, uh, it took a long time to get the domino shifted, in, if you will, the shift bad in the bad direction, shifted over in the good direction. So as we could sequence that. If we don't watch, if we don't man the shipyard, man the ships, about six months, not two months, or one month, six months, the whole strike group before you're ready to go. This will not work right. Uh, and so that's the covenant that we've signed at our respective headquarters, manning headquarters, type commanders, fleet forces, my people, and I have to fund and make sure your folks get the, your folks being fleet forces, command your type commanders, air forces, and, and air land. So that's on us to get that done right. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Please, sir. Ellis C. Davis from Transport Center here at the Roots. I think you briefly touched on the proposed retirement changes, and uh, yeah. like myself, who I guess may have been used to the traditional 401k prior to the 80s, I was hoping you might be able to touch on uh, what your personal thoughts are about the, uh, about the changes. Well, my personal thoughts are I think it's, uh, it can be, I think it's a good idea. And here's what I'd say. First of all, it was a good idea. idea. You all have signed up, all, the, all you people in uniform, and there are people, probably seniors in high school, who are, haven't signed up but will, and they will, they will come in under the current system. All right, the, you want to call it traditional, that's fine. Uh, but what that means is, well, we are all vesting, we are all deferring the vesting, which means the retirement is ours. We actually get money, we have a retirement package. We are deferring that to the 20 year point. To, and that's what it says. But then you get 50%, and you say, well, that's, it's pretty straightforward what happens then. And it, it kind of rises, you know, 2.5% when you stay beyond 20 years. What the new system uh, will look like, it's called a blended retirement, uh, and it will go something like this. Uh, somebody, person joins the military, they are immediately entered into a thrift savings plan. Uh, immediately, the, fed, the federal government puts 1% in that thrift savings plan. After a few years, when they are completed training and we look through most of where the attrition takes place, then they are called what's what we call vested. That means they have a 401k. It consists of a thrift savings plan that has been 1% has been put in. And you now, uh, unless you don't want to do this and you have to be deliberate and you have to go see somebody and you have to get counsel to be sure you know what you're doing, if you don't want this thing, you want any contributions, that's uh, one option. But if, if you don't do that, 2% of your pay will go in to, to this thrift savings plan. So that's 3% total, right? One from the government. So then at, at the five-year point, I think it's a four or five-year point, uh, the details are, are really just still being finally ironed out, that percentage goes up. So 2% to 3%. Federal government goes up from 1% to 3%. And now you have almost 6% going in at when you're finished with just roughly your first enlistment. You with me? And that's your plan. If you finish your first enlistment, you say, I'm leaving. And say, okay, well, here's your 401k. Take it with you when you leave. So uh, if you re-enlist as you go out into your second re-enlistment, uh, the, the government stays at 3%, and you can slowly increase. Uh, you have options to increase your contribution. You with me? That can grow up to about 10% total of your base pay going into your retirement scheme. You stayed at 20 years, instead of getting 50%, you get 40%. But you've had a growing uh, retirement there. You see a, a thrift savings plan, if you will, a 401k going there. You stay beyond 20 years, it, you can continue to contribute in there. Uh, now, when you get somewhere between eight in 16 years, what we asked, the service chiefs, we said, look, we want to be able to provide a continuation pay, a bonus, a reenlistment bonus. And we, wanted to, we want to be able to have control of that, somewhere between 8 and 16 years. So when you reenlist, and well, we probably target it after your second reenlistment. You, you reenlist, you finish that reenlistment, now you're thinking of going, and you're at the 8 or 9 or 10 year point, and you're thinking of staying beyond that. We would want to give you a reenlistment bonus. Um, 
varies. Uh, Twelve thousand dollars is as a baseline, and some would get more, some might get a tad less. It depends on what your rating is. Follow me. So, the, what we're looking for is something that gives you options, opportunity. Let me say to change it, uh, something that you can control, and something that would be by the time you finish. Let's say you stayed for 25 years versus somebody who stayed 25 years under today's scheme. It has a somewhat of an equivalency of value at that point. So control for you, opportunity for you to expand, you know, expand it if you want, and something that's about equivalent out there. Now I'm going like this, about equivalent, because where you invested, because you're going to control a little bit of the investment. Do you want to be very, very conservative and put it in savings bonds or you know, bonds or something like that? mutual funds, and if you do TSP today, it's the same choices, whether you want to be conservative or take a little more risk. Follow me? So the stock would be similar to the ones that are currently in TSP now? Very much so. It'll be very much so. That, because the same managers, you, you will enter into the TSP, the thrift savings plan that the federal government has today. Okay? Sure. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Aaron Ferbert, VFA 106. <coughs> and my question today to you is, there's been a lot of talk lately about um, potentially new uniforms coming out. So what's the status of that? And if that were to pass, if you will, how would we go about getting the new uniforms? Would that be something that's... OK. Well, there's a whole host of stuff coming out. What, anything you're interested in, particularly? Uh, currently, NWEs, they don't, they don't breathe. Yeah, okay. The uh, lighter NWs are, are being uh, sewn, if you will, created now, you know. Uh, they're being put together and they should be in, uh, you're not going to like this, they should be in, in like 2016 to say, man, it's going to be a hot summer. And I say, yeah, I, I too wanted them sooner, but it's easier said than done. Uh, so they'll have a better t-shirt and they'll be lighter weight available for you, but 2016. Uh, anything else you're interested in? No. Is that a no? I, I think that's, that's good enough? Okay. So, you know, service dress blues uh, with the zipper, better piping. That's next year. That'll take, uh, they'll be introduced next year uh, for male and female. So that's, we've decided on that one. Uh, PT uh, gear will be issued. A better, uh, uh, if you will, running suit, wind pants, you know, whatever you want to call that. Uh, that'll be ready at the more or the middle of 2016, and those will be issued. And if you say, well, what's going to look like? We took the material the Marines had, looked pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. Same maker, cheaper, keep the price down, just buy more of some, something material made by somebody else. Okay? Anybody over here? Okay. Good morning, sir. Hello. Uh, Smith, Oceana, I'm in an apartment. Uh, in reference to tuition assistance, um, we have a, a certain cap we, we can get for fiscal year. Uh, a lot of us run into an issue where, in a situation, we get that cap. Now we, we don't go to school for a few months or we get them to our GI Bill. Is there any discussion as far as maybe raising that or uh, getting it waiverable for a case-by-case -case basis? You know what? Uh, I'll take back the waiverable. If you're in a program that uh, is of high value to the Navy, you know what I'm saying, pay back. Uh, you're into, like, what would that be? I don't know, a cyberish kind of a thing or something where, you know, you get a skill set, then maybe waverable. But I would say generally we find, we're just finding that, you know, we, we have to have some cap and we take it on a notional level of what uh, a, a notional sailor would do to be able to do their quals, take, you know, number of courses and all that. So uh, I'll take it back and I'll say, take a look at this, uh, see what kind of education that we, we really need. And if somebody's pursuing that, why wouldn't that be waiverable? Okay? All right. But just summarily raising the cap is probably a non-starter because it's a DOD-wide. Some of those regulations are DOD-wide. That'd be a long uphill climb, trust me. Good morning, sir. Good morning. AMC Fernandez, FRC Mid Atlantic. Uh, going back to ship sustainability, maintenance-wise, throughout the shipyard and deployments, has there been any talk about, or perhaps an idea of implementing a corrosion division within the ship's company, the same way a squadron has uh, a paint and corrosion division that focuses specifically on the earth? So they would be a full-time? Yes, sir. 
So, I don't know, a whole text or something like that? Uh, a little bit more specific to general ship's corrosion. Uh, no, I, I mean, so to you, let me let me say uh, something like take whole text or something like that, uh, uh, educate them properly, give them skills and understanding of corrosion, like we do something like that with you all, huh? with ABS. No, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, let me take that back. That may not be a bad idea. We are having more and more corrosion issues, particularly with tanks, and the ships aren't getting any younger. So uh, let me take a look at that. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Admiral. Good morning, Steve Johnson, NAS Oceana. Uh, my question to you today is regarding dual military VH. Uh, recently, the Senate Armed Forces Committee passed their version of the FMA bill that you. would potentially nix it. And I, from what I was aware, that the White House is starting to budge back against it, and also the Department of Defense is uh, budging back against it. What are your thoughts about it? And if the event uh, dual military VH does go away, is there any formulation or plan to help to offset costs? I don't know about a plan to offset it because we feel that we don't think it'll carry, okay? We just don't think it'll carry. Uh, and you say, well, wait a minute, it got, in the, you know, it got in the budget, and I'd say, well, lots of things get in one house. So there are four, there are four committees, so it's in one committee. Uh, but we're vehemently against it. Um, if, if the feeling is, hey, hey, it was never intended to be like this, my view would be, if that's the case, then we need to methodically work through this and you know, kind of tamp this, allow people to adjust their lifestyle if, if that has to become a law. But that was not, we didn't give that as an option. But I think, uh, we all think it's a d draconian measure when you all have commitments, you find fiscal commitments you sign up to, and then just like that, uh, you know, half of uh, that part goes away. Doesn't make sense to us. It's, it's really, uh, I think uh, uh, not holding up uh, our end of a covenant, R being the, the broader R, the government. Okay? Yeah, I no, appreciate it. Sure. Good morning, Admiral. Good morning, Simpson. Um, NAS Oceana Security Officer. Um, first, I want to thank you for, um, and your staff and all the folks that push that MPB, MPVP through. Uh, that's a big deal to us on a daily basis around here. Secondly, I want to ask a question or just make the comment that uh, some of the problems that we have in the security force world when we talk about active response to an active shooter is the lack of identifying my folks. Virginia Beach rolls up, um, my folks roll into a building and they're running towards bullets, but there's nothing on the back of a uniform that says, hey, this guy's security, don't shoot him. So my guy turns around, you know, everybody in this, in this theater is mainly uh, in blue. So that's what Virginia Beach show, sees when they show up. So my comment is maybe with the new uniform fixes is, maybe have some sort of identifying patch that security forces can put on the back of their uniform um, says police or security, so. Yeah, that's, boy, I'm getting some pretty good ideas here. Uh, so Skipper, uh, or, or, uh, or do you have any organizational, Lieutenant, do you have any organizational clothing for when your people take the watch, they just come in MWs? Yes, sir, it's all, it's all funding issues, so I don't have. Well, what about a vest or something like it? Uh, the most we have is the reflective uh, security police vests that we wear, um, which the new SIF that's established is now just sending us orange vests with yellow stripes that don't say police on them. And I think they're trying to fix that, but that's a little bit above me. Okay, well, let me start with, instead of being broadly organizational, we just talk, had a uniform question, you know where that, how long that would take. Uh, let me talk to CNIC and see if there isn't something that you can just quickly put on, uh, that's like thing, but clearly distinctive that your law enforcement. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Sir. Thanks. Very good. <clears throat> yeah. Sir, Lieutenant Morales, VFA 106. You mentioned the performance that Secretary Mavis uh, talked about. Right. Uh, right. Academy, uh, concerning the Defense Office of Personal Management Act and other statutes that need to be changed in order to uh, enact those initiatives. Can you talk more about the process, the timeline, and uh, exactly how that's going to um, there were a number of, is there one that has you more interested than others? Uh, specifically timing uh, in regards to the Defense Officer Personal Management Act. Okay, the Defense Officer Personal Management Act, DOPMA. That is a large windmill that, you know, we're kind of attacking, if you will. But, uh, so to say, hey, we want to revise DOPMA. That's, that's, uh, that's a two-year minimum uh, initiative, in my view. On the other hand, if we say, uh, when it comes to officer 
promotions. We would like to re-rack folks within the year based upon how they came out on the board. Okay, that's probably not a bad idea. We would like to manage year, if they say you have to be in a year group. See, we, in the end, we'd like to remove year groups and say you just, you're just a person. Instead of having to have some magical period of time that that year group all goes up for promotion. And because some people were away at graduate school, some people were doing a different job, and some people were in the cockpit. So who do you think is going to get promoted, right? But after a period of time, when everybody's got to do their joint professional military education, you get my point, it all kind of equals out. So uh, we're saying, all right, if you're in your group number one, and so you got all your peers, and you go away to graduate school as a junior officer, uh, and you come back, I don't think you should stay in your group number one unless you want to. You should have that option. But you need but be advised, your peers have been flying and you were away at graduate school, so you have one tour. You get my point. And see they got two or three. So you may want to come back to a different year group and then come in. And then in the end it, it sort of equalizes out. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, so we want to do this uh, uh, a little bit piecemeal, but uh, but we're changing the processes within Dogma. To change, to take the, the whole thing and say, look, we need to change dogma. Boy, we've been, that's a big rock to push up a hill. Uh, so we want the ones, the ones that are nagging and the ones that are absurd and we need to fix now. Follow? Okay, thanks. Good morning, sir. Good Amy morning. I'm a doctor and an associate at Chapel. Um, with the proposed family implementation with the um, maternity leave being extended, is there a possibility for paternity leave being extended? Because uh, from my understanding, fathers only get 10 days. I don't know. Um, and I'd, I'd have to see what uh, we easily just throw maternity leave because that's what we assume the situation, that's what's needed. Um, I'd have to look at the paternity element of that. And so we will. I'll take that back and say, so what is the overall uh, intent? Um, you know, just the woman, because delivering a child, what about, are we looking at the family situation in this regard? And that's two people. Okay? Good morning. Good morning. I have another question about the new PRP standard, but more in regards to uh, CEOs now being able to enforce random spot checks in between the PFA tests. Um, I was just wondering, when can we expect to see this being put into effect? Uh, how will commands go about uh, helping spot check vendors to get back in shape? And is this going to be mandatory since it won't be enforced as punitive? Well, um, when, when in effect, I'd say maybe calendar year 16. Um, I'm, we're going to meet soon. Uh, I've asked, I've got to sit down with Chief Naval Personnel, Mick Pond, Surgeon General, and myself, say, okay, let me make sure I understand this, and we go see SECNAP lay it out. Then we've got to lay it out for all of you in English so you can see how does this work. The intent though is this, to say, look, uh, we want you to be healthy and I'm asking the, the Surgeon General, how do we, what is a good way to set a minimum standard to just to be healthy? So you have a reasonable assurance that you're healthy. Well, if you're obese, that's not healthy. That's not a good healthy standard, right? So we say, well, how do we know if you're obese? As one way. So we, we look at that, and, and there are DOD standards of, to determine obesity. They're measuring standards. Follow what I'm saying? So that's kind of one. Two, how often should you get a physical to make sure you're healthy? And what do we check in the physical uh, have, as time goes on? So that's part of that whole, you know, your, your physical health assessment. And then we say, well, how fit are you? Well, first of all, we want to make sure you're exercising. So if you're not obese, I want you exercising. And if you were obese, we want the commanding officer to be able to say, we want to get you, you off the obese thing so we don't hurt you, you know, become more at risk, and get exercising so you can be fit, pass, and, and move on. So that's the intent of this. It's not really to say, hey, you, why don't you go, go do PRT? You know, I'm not sure I like what you did there. Go do the PRT. You know, that, that's not. If we see that, we'll drop the hammer. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Uh, and the intent is not to do that. Is if, do you follow what I mean? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And then if you do well, as the gentleman earlier said, you ought to be acknowledged for being a person of, of you know, high standards of fitness. 
So that's, that's what we're looking to do. It will not be perfect, ladies and gentlemen, you know that. But I think we'll be, uh, what I want is something that I could stand up here and say, hey look, I want you to be healthy, here's a minimum level of health, you gotta be better than this, okay? Uh, and then we're gonna measure you at an appropriate time, and I need you to exercise. We gotta give you decent food, so we're not giving you fatty foods all the time. So the sec you'll see the secretary has that piece in it. And then you, when you need to be fit, so you can be an effective member of your ship, squadron, submarine, whatever. Uh, follow? Yes, sir. All right, thanks. Hi, good morning, sir. I'm Adrian Hong from BFA 106. I had a question for you. Um, we did our bystander uh, intervention training just recently, past couple of days, and the question that kept coming up was an incident, say um, you were at a bar and you're just relaxing by yourself, or um, and you see a fight break out between shipmates, maybe you someone you work with, so you go to break it up, and you're just doing what you were taught in the training, and they end up getting arrested, and because you're separating them, they hit you because you get arrested as well. So when you come back to the command, you end up getting an ARI for just helping out a shipmate. So how can we effectively help other sailors without getting ourselves in trouble? <laughs> well, I have not seen many of these where I hang out. But I want to tell you, I was a junior officer too. I find it rare, I, I found it rare that there weren't witnesses to that because somebody yells fight or you hear people screaming, you can't help yourself. You go over and see what's going on. I would expect witnesses to stand forward and say, hey, uh, what's your first name? Kira. Kira was trying to help out here, was, was trying to break it up and would step forward. I would expect that our law enforcement people who came in and did whatever to arrest would seek you know, uh, uh, witnesses and say, okay, so tell me, because you would say, hey, wait a minute, I'm a, I was a bystander, I was just coming in to break this thing up. You get my point, that this could be, are you saying that people found that, no, that's not really what's gonna happen, or what? Well, in some cases, you know, um, some people may not be over the legal limit, and right. some may be under, right. so they still arrest the individual in those cases because they are over the legal limit and think that their capabilities and understanding and mobility are not gonna be the same as a person um, who is under the legal limit and their judgment is more credible than being over the limit. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. So let me give you, let's say, you're sitting down and you have a few drinks, and we're not talking about going out and drive, so I assume that's what you mean by the legal limit, right? Well, the situation I was um, talking about was them sitting down in a bar. Yeah, but, but my point would be, when you say legal limit, the only limit I know that is legal, that has to do with alcohol, is the limit to drive. So, and you may be over that, but this doesn't do with driving. So if somebody says, is, is that what you're, that's what you're referring to, right? Yes, by the, the law, the legal standards, but um, yeah. in some cases in this area, most yeah. of the bars are outside, yeah. so it becomes um, public intoxication as well. All right, well, if uh, public, you know, we're into legal terms, what is public intoxication, that's interpretive, uh, it's not really a blood alcohol level per se, right, because people uh, react differently. Uh, I leave you with, uh, we need, your shipmates to step up and ensure that you, by doing the right thing, didn't do that, and, and witnesses. At the same time, uh, you have the right to, to act and say, wait a minute, there are witnesses here to call them in, and I would expect our legal people and those that support you in this regard and every command team that I know out there to take the time to get to the bottom line. Especially, I would be shocked, I'd be amazed if for some reason, you know, you being somebody who had bystander intervention, uh, were swept up and, and end up being uh, that, that that you weren't acknowledged, you know, by somebody out there as no, in fact, somebody who was trying to do the right thing. Uh, so, uh, are you now going to tell me no? That's not what happened. Or are you going to tell me no? Okay, I just want to know how that might work out. Well, because I asked, because there's several um, incidents that's happened that I've been aware of from other people just you know, explaining themselves to me, where they actually ended up getting an AOR when they were actually trying to do the best thing possible. Yeah. Well, I. It depends on on that situation, but that's the best I can tell you. Standing up here with uh, lights on me and uh, my IQ dropping as I speak. <laughs> okay, but, but it is a logical, uh, sensible thing. 
uh, we can't have that. And so I expect every command triad, and I expect sailors to help out other sailors who are trying to do the right thing. We have to do that. Okay, Thank thanks. You, Good morning, man. Good morning. Turns from right now from 18 more to ever seen in the year. And uh, I had a question about the maritime control for Thompson's uh, community. Yes. And what can we expect to see happen with the uh, EV3 areas in the coming years? And if they are being replaced with uh, UAVs, how will that affect? The, the uh, EP3 will be eventually replaced uh, with um, not only just the Triton, but really a, a kind of a consortium of a P8 uh, that will fly and do some. Uh, and we will use the Triton uh, as well as uh, appropriate unmanned from, um, from the carrier uh, to do that. So it's really the, sort of the federation of all of those and what each one of those will provide. Uh, as well as, you know, it might be a reaper that's helping you out. It may be another uh, unmanned, but it'll be a collection. It'll still be partially manned and unmanned as they bring that together. But the EP3 has to sundown. They are getting old, and we don't have a replacement. And uh, I mean, the, some element of a P8 will will be a contributor to that, but we won't have an EP8 if that's what you're wondering. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, currently transitioning from VFA 106 to VFA 83. Uh, my question was touching base on the JSF as well as the legacy form. With the uh, recent uh, upage and high time hours for the legacy platform, uh, and also myself currently ramping up from uh, deployment, is NAVBAIR going to be supplying sufficient parts to maintain the legacy up until the JSF is fielded to the fleet, or are we just going to have to basically wean? Hornets off one by one, say ten position, things of that nature, sir. Uh, we will. Step one will be legacy slept, service life extension, <clears throat> and back out to be available. Some number of them will be used for training. Some of them, and and less of them, will be in the air wing. You know, the deploying air wing. If that makes sense to you. That will step down in a deliberate manner. Um, they better provide parts because I know I'm putting money into it. Uh, and if there are no parts, uh, then that we got a problem with people that we hire to give us parts. Now, we have had delays in parts. There's no question about that. Uh, of all things, and it, I was very disappointed, it was in the Super Hornet. I said, what's that about? We're working our way through that. Okay, contracts were changed, and you know we've had a lot of attention by the Airbus, Admiral Shoemaker, uh, by the chief of uh, supply corps and you know kind of our thumbs on their head to get on this uh, because it to me it's just unconscionable that we don't provide you enough parts to keep those those aircraft that are out on the tarmac or, or you know in the hangar up uh, if they're in depot okay that's another issue so yes the the intent is to keep the legacy uh, on the proper track to sundown um, I frankly would uh, just as soon sundown them sooner than later, but, but I'm not proposing to accelerate it. Uh, I'm saying, you know, they're just going to cost more and more and be able to fly less and less as we get on. We shouldn't be overly dependent on it. We've got to migrate uh, and bring in the Super Hornets uh, at the right numbers and get the Joint Strike Fighter in. So I kind of look at where are we going to be at 2024 and 2025. That's the, that's the year away is where my, that's where I'm keeping track of as I look out ahead on Legacy, Super Hornet, and JSF. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Aaron Pittman from VFA 31. I was wondering, I have another question about the uniforms. Has there been any consideration of making the material of the uniform to change color to a brighter color in contact with the salt water for a ship that's fall overboard on the ship? No, I'm not familiar with that. And, and I heard some people or some vendors say, you know, I can make this. Uh, and uh, like you said, you know, so people don't disappear, quote unquote, uh, when we get them in the water. You hear all that kind of stuff. But I'm unaware of anything that was uh, useful, that, that actually worked, uh, that actually, uh, you know, it's going to get wet, right? So it's, it might change color with salt water. That'll happen. And then how often does it, quote unquote, change color? Get, get bright and be useful. We, we did some testing and we didn't find anything that was durable. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
Good morning, sir. Aaron Magnus from CNET USU. Good morning. I have a question about uh, hearing talk from out of the branches about tattoo policy. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, what policy? Tattoo policy about reforming. Are we expecting any? I, I'm not. Could you say out the acronym? Tattoo. Oh, tattoo policy. <laughs> That's not a good acronym. Uh, no, I know of no change to the tattoo policy. Uh, what'd you hear? Um, I was hearing about how we go a sleeve length full sleeve shirt. That you could what's that? You could get a full sleeve shirt. You could get a full sleeve tattoo. That'd be okay. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. I'm just not familiar with it. Uh, nobody's talked to me about it. Maybe I'd ask, huh? Thank you, sir. Guys, you want one? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> well, let me ask. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Chairman Blaylock over at Strike Crime School 15, and my question is with the legalization of same sex marriage, would those couples start to receive the same VAH benefits as traditional marriage? Um, I think that's already in place. Uh, we've already looked at, remember, what the, the Marine Corps. The, sorry, Marine Corps. the Supreme Court ruling really went beyond uh, what some states were already doing, and uh, so I, I don't see any change in our guidelines with regard to that, if that makes sense. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. From Security. I have a question regarding females and PRT. I know there's a six month extension for PRT waivers for individuals just coming off con leave, but is there going to be an extension around the lines of individuals that have C-section considering we're getting our abdomen torn apart and we have to rebuild? Well, I have to confess I'm not familiar with that particular uh, element of it, but um, <coughs> because you have a question, we'll take that back and say, uh, uh, clearly, what you see now, you th don't think is right, or what do you think? No, sir. I think there should be a little bit longer time for okay. females that do get a C-section to rebuild right. their muscles. Like I personally had a C-section, and right. I'm having difficulties just getting bare minimum. Right. Okay. Well, let me take that particular element back as we do this change. We, we got to count. We got to consider those things that are out there, all of them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. AB2 Banking, NASOCIANA. Um, my question is in regards to, uh, you touched briefly on advancement and uh, pay. If there was going to be any changes possibly in the delay of being paid from being advanced. Some sailors can wait up to six months, whereas somebody who may have been capped gets paid immediately. And I was just wondering if there was any talks about reform of getting paid sooner. I'm not familiar with that. I'll ask the Chief of Naval Personnel to address, you know, how is that dressed or clarified and uh, when we go from cap to map or whatever we call that, okay? Thank you, sir. Sure. Good morning, sir. AZ3 Taylor, VFA32. My uh, question is about environmental sustainability and when the fleet would begin to implement alternative fuel resources. Well, we still have, uh, there are some guidelines, <coughs> some driven by law that say, you have to be sure if you're gonna use alternative f fuels, such as biofuel or that, that the, the pricing is less, that it is cost effective to go buy an alternate fuel. Uh, and so, so A, we gotta make sure it, it uh, properly works as an alternative fuel, because if it doesn't work well and it's not proven, then it's not an alternative fuel. And we're doing that, so the, the, uh, uh, the great green fleet, if you will, the <coughs> deployment will go a long way. We've, we've done uh, shortened tests, you're familiar, we had the, the green strike group uh, in, in RIMPAC in 2012. So now in 16, we'll actually go uh, around the world as we, as we look longer periods. Uh, we'll see the results of that to see is the fuel viable? Yes, no, maybe so. What fuel is most viable? What fuel can we get in bulk? Where are our partners out there? We really need to get the airline industry involved in this, I think, if you want to help drive, because they have enormous fuel users and if they're, if they're involved too, then we have something. Uh, and then you have to see what are the economics of the situation. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good morning, sir. Ed Anderson Palatino. Good morning. Senior unit, Hampton Roads, Yamnack Yanks. Uh, my question is, uh, is the policy of the Navy going to be <coughs> require all sailors to obtain their warfare device? Uh, as it is right now, uh, some people receive adverse evals or even uh, rec uh, removal of the recommendation to or a re-enlistment if they do not receive them? Well, not every community 
has a warfare device that I'm aware of, every single you know, part of the Navy. But those that do, if they enter in a community, they'll say, hey, I need you to qualify uh, within that to be an effective sailor and, and shipmate. And so I usually tend to allow those communities to develop that in concert with what the, the chief of naval personnel. So the air boss, the surface boss, sub boss, you know, you get head CB and all that, they come together with the MCPON and the senior list to say, what do we need our sailors to do to be effective? And we acknowledge that being that sailor with a warfare device, if that makes sense. So it's not like we, uh, hey, we, we need everybody to be able to wear a pin. It's to be most effective out there. So that's the way it's being managed. There, I don't sit up there in Washington as the chief of naval, chief of naval operations, and declare you know that kind of piece. So uh, we're, I guess I'll say we're a little flexible in that regard. But it's what we need out there in the fleet that that drives that. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm Masudi from BFA 106. Um, I have a question. Um, I know that uh, the United States is conducting training in uh, uh, troubled areas such as the Middle East uh, for uh, foreign military. Um, and uh, my question is, as a United States Navy, do we have any plans of recruiting um, uh, more uh, personnel uh, from foreign countries to be actually as a force of uh, working for this country but is more oriented towards uh, troubled areas such as the Middle East? No, we don't, uh, we don't control. We can't do it uniquely as a Navy to, to say, I tell you what, I'm going to go over and get these folks from this country uh, and say, just, just come on in because I'll need you. And then I'll, when I steam over to that area, you'll be readily available. Uh, our, our entrance requirements are, are driven by the military, DOD-wide. Uh, and fairly closely regulated by the federal government. Thank you, sir. All right. You need to hold the mic a little closer, please. Yes, you can. I just wanted to get a better understanding on the being married females more, your age, as far as um, what brought it into consideration and like how could it benefit uh, military personnel as far as if one spouse is having trouble. Yeah, the I think that now that you're talking about the, the, the two <coughs> service members each getting BAH or not. That's that's the question, right? Yes, sir. Okay. What the, I think the basis was uh, the feeling by someone I don't know who it was up uh, in the Congress and in this particular uh, uh, committee felt that the original intent of BAH was to provide a household uh, appropriate allowance for quarters. For housing and that if you're single you get this amount if you are if you have dependents you get that amount and you say if, if there are two single you know then that's still one household in the view of this person and you'd say so you get dependent BAH there you go and and so that's not the way it came out obviously we are where we are and people plan their lives accordingly they incur uh, debt um, instruments accordingly. They build their households. You know, all the thing you're just describing. They have a routine. And so if that was the original intent, then there, our view is we should debate it. And first of all, we need to understand what is the impact on the whole force if you do that? What do our people feel about that? And uh, probably not well, all great. And how, if you say, well, regardless, that's the intent, say, okay, well, they're all hooked up to legal commitments here, fiscal commitments. How would we allow them to get off of this, to kind of adjust the life you just described? And so that's our point, to say, you can't do this, uh, you shouldn't do this clicking your fingers. That's not a good idea. That's bad for morale. It's bad for the covenant that we feel we have with our people. We in the Navy feel we have with our sailors. That's where the Secretary, the Commandant, and myself are with this. All right. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Dylan from VFA 106. 
My question is with regards to supply. Uh, one of the issues I've been having with ordering supplies is that we only have one manufacturer, and in that the prices are a bit high because it's only one, and the <coughs> length of time that we are getting stuff in is taking extremely long because they are the only um, producer of this product. So I was wondering if we could possibly look into trying to get other companies so we could have a little bit of competition in getting stuff in and prices. And, um, what what is this sole provider not the not the company but what is it that you're talking about what kind of stuff what kind of materials hazardous material well i have one one particular adhesive we're waiting on for the past year and a half yeah. that hasn't gotten to us yet and when i did my research on the flight line people have been uh, individuals have been waiting for it for at least three years and this particular company is um, kind of slow in producing it, and we yeah. really need to fix our aircraft. Yeah, you're being very kind and diplomatic. You know, I'm a little. <laughs> it's very nice of you. Did you see the value of competition, right? Yes. Because because next year, if you were in charge, you'd say you're out. Uh, who else would like this money? Consistency every year, right? Because yes. we're going to be around here for a while. Master Jet Bait and all the things you use, and that's why competition is so important. And that's why when we have things like sequestration, budget reductions, hit, miss, this, that, if some, uh, some companies say, I can't compete, I, you know, I'm not big enough to, to be able to take the swings, the economic swings that, that you guys cause us, and then sometimes you will get, sometimes, broader companies, and what they provide you is not what they do all the time. They say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do this material. And, uh, and you, they know you're the, the sole provider, so they jack it up a little bit, and they honestly don't worry that much about it. So, competition brings you leverage on providing and also in building. So it's, it's so important, and we see it time and time again. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. I think we're clear. I think we're clear, and it's 10 o'clock. Yes, sir. Thank you all very much. Let me... Uh, let me leave you with a few thoughts. Uh, clearly, we've got the 4th of July weekend coming up. Uh, we're having safety-wise, and you all, in the business you're in, know about safety. The aviation community knows safety, is good safety better than anybody that I know of, and we actually use you to uh, what the other communities do. But uh, the flight line, we're doing much better than we did last year, which was not a great year. We're doing much better. Uh, I'm going to go see the, the director of safety here shortly. But it's the, uh, it's the off-duty stuff that I worry about. So we need you to come back after this long weekend. So enjoy yourself. Uh, enjoy yourself with your family. And those of you, some of the families out here, tell them, uh, please thank them for me, for supporting you and what you do. I see civilians here or there. I want to thank you. You are civilian shipmates. Uh, we can't get done what we need to get done without you supporting us and being part uh, of our team. I thank you very much for that. You're kind of the, we come and we go on these bases and out there, out and around and up in headquarters, and you're there time and time again, kind of holding the thing together like mortar holding bricks together. So take care of each other, treat each other with dignity and respect like we talked about before, and thanks for uh, your support. Uh, we'll go back with uh, your input here that I mentioned and see what we can do to make things a little better. Thank you very much.